Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be talking about fuel systems, the different components of a fuel system on an airplane. Now this is uh, one of those topics that we should, probably should have brought up ages ago, because believe it or not, a lot of this stuff is actually pretty important, and depending on the type of aircraft, the type of fuel system you have on board can be quite different. So we're going to basically break it down between different types of airplanes, and kind of showing you how all the components are really the same, with their own little quirks. Let's go ahead and get started. So first things first, uh, I don't need to explain, but fuel is required in order to make airplanes go. It's as simple as that. Now, getting the fuel from the fuel tanks, which are typically located in the wings, or the fuselage of bigger aircraft that we'll see in a little while, requires basically a bunch of all sorts of pipes. In this particular case, you can actually see we have a little hose here that comes and drops down below us, and then it comes through some type of valve that allows us to turn the fuel on and off. Now, one of the things you're probably going to observe, and I'll go ahead and I'll float my head down here, is many small aircraft have a simple little valve here that allows us to switch which tank we're pulling fuel from at any given moment. In this case, this is a very, very small, very, very simple plane. So we have two tanks to pick from, a left wing tank, and we have a right wing tank. Now, the other option you're going to notice, chilling here in the middle, is just the word both. Now, the reason this is kind of an interesting little thing here is because of the fact that many aircraft, um, basically by U.S. regulations, we have to be able to isolate a tank. So what will happen is uh, aircraft that have the both option actually have one tank that both of the engine, uh, the wing tanks rather, are feeding into that the engine then feeds from directly. So when we actually switch this to the left position, that didn't seem intuitive, but what you're actually doing is closing off the right valve to only allow fuel to flow from the left into that little feeding tank that you have in the middle. Obviously, switching this to off is uh, going to cut off fuel from our aircraft. Now, the thing that this is important about is when you get to other types of aircraft, such as a Piper, you'll observe the fact that we don't have that little collector fill a feeder tank. So we actually have a straight up left or right selector. Now, the reason this is kind of tricky, of course, is we have to make sure that we actually swatch between these as we're actually running the aircraft. Now, one of the reasons I jumped into our Piper Warrior here is because of the fact that it has a unique problem that you're also going to have to deal with in any fuel system, and that's getting the fuel from the tank through that hose into the engine where it actually needs to get the work done. So the cool thing here is when you're dealing with a high wing airplane like the CH-701 we saw a minute ago, gravity can actually do quite a bit of the work. But when you get to a low wing, gravity can help you here because unfortunately the engine is actually higher than the actual source of fuel. So you require a fuel pump. Uh, before I got ahead of myself here, all aircraft have fuel pumps. It doesn't matter if they're high wing or low wing. The difference being is that these sort of aircraft desperately need that uh, fuel pump in the engine in order to operate and will actually have usually a backup auxiliary pump, whereas those other aircraft sometimes will have a backup auxiliary pump. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the instrumentation we have here as far as fuel stuff goes. You're going to notice a couple different gauges here. The first ones are going to be how much fuel capacity we actually have. Now, I fly in the real world, and I can tell you right now that these instruments are tenuously accurate at best. Uh, they can tell you have no fuel, and they can usually tell you have a full tank on the ground, but that, that's about as much as they're going to be. Again, the float-based ones are garbage. They have a special capacitive style fuel gauges, which work fantastic. The cool thing here is that you have to remember that these needles are not necessarily a linear flow. As a matter of fact, if you look at this one here, see how the distance between 0 and 10 is this far, and the distance between 10 and 20 is this far, and the difference between 20 and 24 is like a hee-hee -he little thing compared to this gauge? That's not unusual. I think that might actually be a photo error, but I'm not going to worry about it too much. The other thing you're going to observe here is we have our fuel pressure. The fuel pressure is going to be telling us exactly how much fuel is being trying to be pushed into the carburetor inside of this engine right now. You'll notice it's got a lovely green range here, and you'll also probably observe the fact that if I increase my power a little bit, let me go ahead and I'll rev us up a little bit, the fuel pressure should start to climb as the engine itself starts to start consuming more fuel. Now, the interesting thing is that's a little weird that it did not climb, but um, don't worry, the next airplane I'll show you that will climb. And of course, if I pull that back, that's going to cause it to drop as well. Now, this aircraft, ah, mystery solved. And the reason that aircraft did not change is because a lot of aircraft actually have fuel pumps. Now, fuel pumps come in a wide variety of different um, types here. Notice, by the way, when I cut the fuel pump, the pressure drop. Now, if I stomp on it, there it goes. Incompetence on my part, everyone. Sorry about that. What this fuel pump does is it acts as a backup for the engine fuel pump in the event that there's some kind of a mechanical failure of it. That, would, of course, would cause a catastrophic engine shutdown. So a lot of times on aircraft like this, you will flip on that fuel pump for takeoff. We wouldn't leave it on forever, of course, because you're just running the pump in this creating a lot of extra pressure that doesn't need to be generated. So once we're in a cruise, we can go ahead and use that. But you can see by cutting that, we have a massive drop of pressure that is basically going to be indicative of having some kind of problem on this one. Now, these aircraft, like I said, are relatively simple. We got a couple tanks. We have a fuel pump that helps us out in the event that uh, we have a drop of pressure from the engine fuel pump. And it's all relatively easy to use. It gets more complicated. 
When we start moving to aircraft that have multiple engines or they have turboprop engines, things start to get a little more complicated because now, whereas our simple system would just let the fuel slip in, suddenly it's not so easy anymore, especially if you have a situation where I need to run this engine from this side of the plane. So let's go ahead and climb and board this one real fast. And uh, what I've done is I've actually grabbed ourselves a handy dandy diagram of this exact aircraft so you can see what the fuel system actually looks like. So the way that they do this, as crazy as this sounds, is you actually have multiple types of tanks on board. You have basically going to be your primary tank here, and you're going to have your wing tanks, and then you have a separate central auxiliary tank that everything is actually coming through. Now, the reason this is so crazy is basically you've got this little zone here. This is in a cell tank here that's stored behind the engine. This is your primary. Your main fuel tank is actually in the wing, and then you have this little backup fuel tank kind of in the middle of the airplane. Now, this is going to be a common trend as the aircraft get progressively bigger. Now, the reason this is so crazy is let's say I needed to provide fuel to the engine on this side with this fuel tank. That's when you introduce yourself to this concept of a cross-feed valve. And what that is, is that's a little valve that actually runs between the, through the bottom of the plane to the copied version of this, the symmetrical side on the other engine here that can allow fuel to flow to both sides. Now, the thing that's important here is in the event that we have some kind of uh, fuel pressure failure, let's say this gets blocked up or run out of fuel in the left tank, we can still safely actually run the engine from the other tank. Obviously, we're gonna have some balance issues. So now from the pilot seat, we can see all the information that we need to have. And one of the things that they do is as these systems get progressively more complicated, it actually gets easier in order to understand what the system is doing. Now, remember that little valve I was telling you about earlier that was in the middle that gives us the ability to actually run this? There is actually a transfer control valve, which is a little valve that actually allows us to push fuel from one system to the other. The other thing you're going to see is remember how we saw in the diagram the auxiliary tank? If I actually hold the switch down, you'll notice that it is actually holding a different amount of fuel than the main tank itself. Generally, remember, we're pulling out of the main tank. The auxiliaries basically gives us a little bit of fuel that we can kind of suck out of at the same time. Now, the reason this is so interesting is they actually have a mode here that you can actually dial in whether or not you want to force the transfer of the auxiliary fuel out of this system. And again, notice there's a handy dandy little auto button here that we can actually use. Now, the other thing we'll see is we have these two standby pumps. Notice they're inoperative. Those standby pumps are back up fuel pumps for the actual main engine itself. It's kind of sad. So let's go ahead and uh, break everything real quickly here. So let's go up to our handy dandy weight and balance page. You can see we have plenty of fuel. So let's go ahead and uh, run my right engine down quite dramatically here. And we'll leave it right at that point. Now notice, as soon as I let go there, you can see my fuel here is dropping down to nothing. But look what's happening. You can see we've got just a little bit of fuel. Now, if I look over my engine itself, we're going to get a bunch of really, really angry messages uh, to notice. It's the fact that we have a massive fuel imbalance because there's too much fuel basically on one side. And it's also going to tell us that we have very, very low fuel on the right-hand side. So low fuel, as a matter of fact, if I actually click this real quick, you'll notice that um, we're running through that fuel real fast. You can actually see how that right auxiliary tank is basically carrying our load right now as we're sitting here running out of fuel. So um, let's say we didn't want to do that. Let's say we wanted to run this engine off of the other tank. So what they actually do is they have a cross-feed valve here. And what this does is this actually lets you dial in which way you want the fuel to actually flow. Now, for example, if I click it all the way to the left, I'm pumping fuel out of the left to the right. Now, if I click this all the way to the right, what I'm actually doing, this looks like, honestly, this looks centered to me. I'm actually going to be sending fuel here. And you can actually see, just like in our diagram, exactly how they were actually able to do this. Now, you're probably sitting here saying, well, does that mean it's filling that tank? What you're actually looking here is, yes, indeed. Not only are we running fuel out of the left-hand side, but we're actually starting to slowly fill that tank up directly. So if we wanted to, this is crazy, but we could actually go ahead and switch that to fuel tank transfer. And if you take a look here, now we're really, really doing the deed here. Again, that override switch is really an emergency switch. It's not going to do any good for us. If we were, for example, to take this right tank and completely empty it. Let me go ahead and do that. Let's switch this off real quick you can observe that our right main tank is basically holding steady here. It's filling a little teeny tiny bit because remember that engine is sucking gas out of that tank right now and our left tank is doing all the work. As a matter of fact, our left auxiliary tank here, in order, unless it gets to a certain value, it doesn't actually start pulling from the aux tank. So now if I wanted to be really cruel here, I could actually rev us up a little bit. Let's get this thing going a little. Ah, uh, that's pretty good. Okay, no, we're just sitting there kind of basically burning our brakes up, but that's perfectly fine. Now, if I come back in here like this, you'll see here that we're not keeping up. Um, our, that tank is barely filling right now. If anything, we're actually, I can see we're losing fuel here. But basically, this entire aircraft is running really, really, really hard off this left main tank. 
So you can see as the fuel systems get progressively more complicated, they also provide you with new opportunities to deal with some of the problems that come with. Now, this is just getting started with complex. Things start to get a little more challenging when you get to a larger aircraft, especially when you move to something like jets. So climbing on inside this, uh, you can see that things seem to be pretty much the same as we saw before, but there's actually quite a bit of stuff going on inside of this aircraft. As a matter of fact, let me go ahead and quickly call up a diagram just to give you an idea of how complicated the system actually is. So what we can see here is we actually have several tanks that we're dealing with here. We have a little surge tank, we have our basically our left tank here, we have our center tank, and of course we have our right tank as well. And each one of those has unique capacity for fuel. Making things more complicated, of course, is the fact that our aircraft, how, what, where do we put the fuel if we're not carrying a lot? And that's one of the interesting little issues that you're actually going to encounter. Notice, by the way, we have the presence of the crossfeed valve, just like we had before. Uh, one of the nice things about this crossfeed valve, of course, is just by opening it, this system has enough strength to get it. And then all these pumps that are actually spread throughout the tank are basically for the purposes of just getting the fuel into it. Uh, the other thing you're going to notice too is we have fuel return valves which is a little different as well but it's just a way of basically dealing with all that excess fuel that we're shoving into the system so let's climb into the aircraft itself and now let's actually take our heads and go whoopsie daisies and look above so one thing you'll notice here is that we have a number of different switches here it's the same general concept that we had from before but this is kind of interesting here in that these fuel pumps the aircraft can run perfectly fine with them all turned off is it recommended? No, it's putting a lot of stress on the engine fuel pump, but believe it or not, it is something we can actually get away with. The other thing you're gonna observe is the presence of center fuel pumps because we have a central fuel tank on this particular aircraft. Now with this aircraft, one of the interesting things to think about is if we are carrying as much fuel as we possibly absolutely can, we have to actually make sure that we use our fuel in the middle before we use our fuel on the wings. Uh, the easiest way to think about this problem is imagine there's no fuel in the wings, which means there's no extra weight in here. And then we have this very, very, very heavy airplane loaded up with an extra 28,000 pounds of fuel here. When we go to tip, um, these wings are gonna be uh, wanting to rip off the rest of the body as we accelerate. So that's also true when we come back down to land. We wanna suck all the fuel out of the middle here and basically rely on whatever we have left on the wings as we're traveling. Now, fuel on this aircraft is a little more complicated. So if I were to bring up the weight and balance real quickly here, so you can see it, you can see my center tank here. I'm just uh, kind of pounding this gas down pretty fast as I'm running out. Now, if I were to actually run the center tank down to zero, you'll notice it will not allow me to do that. The reason being is this is a PMDG aircraft and they don't play nice with others. They have their own way of kind of handling all this. But if I, for example, were to pop off the fuel pumps inside of here, you'll actually see that that's not gonna really cause any issues because the engine fuel pumps are so darn strong and we have fuel coming from different parts of the aircraft. Now, the interesting thing is, look at this now. You'll see that we're still pulling some fuel out of the center. But the other thing you're gonna observe here is our left main and our right main is actually starting to get fuel pulled from it. You're saying, wait, why is that? Well, remember the pressure that we're creating for those fuel systems is significantly higher than our center pump. So if I actually were to flip those both on, it's gonna get me grumpy at me for a couple moments here as everything stabilizes, you'll notice that my fuel pool from those other parts are actually going to decrease as the pressure from my central tank basically is going to take over. Uh, that's one of the effective methods that we actually have to kind of control the, where the fuel is coming from. Also notice the presence of the crossfeed valve. Uh, the crossfeed valve is a general rule. You're really not supposed to be running a crossfeed valve if you're in takeoff or landing. This is something that if you have a really bad fuel imbalance, you can open this sucker up and basically pressurize one side of the aircraft with the other side of the aircraft using our little crossfeed option here. And again, notice the presence of the diagram, which makes it very, very easy to read. The other thing you're going to see on this aircraft fuel system is the presence of this, and that's going to be our fuel temperature gauge. Now, jet fuel freezes up at minus 40 degrees Celsius. So one of the interesting things we have to always be mindful of is if we're traveling like the Arctic, we have to make sure our fuel is heated somehow. And that's one of those things that many of these aircraft actually handle manually. The other problem you're going to have an aircraft like this, of course, is we have an APU on board, and that fuel has got to come out of somewhere. So if you actually remember that little diagram we had in a minute, a minute ago, actually, let me go ahead and pull that up so you all can see it again real fast. You'll see the fact that the APU actually has its own fuel feed that comes off of the left side. That's why when you're first starting this thing, if you're wondering why it always says no low pressure switch on that side, it's because it's sucking fuel out of that particular component. Now, the other people say, why do we have so many pumps? Uh, the reason for is redundancy. If uh, one of these fails, we have several other pumps that can basically pick up the slack at that particular point. Now, there's one other type of fuel system we want to take a look at and that is that of a dedicated military aircraft. Now, one of the downsides of being a fighter is we need to cram as much fuel as we positively absolutely can into this thing, but we also need to make sure we maintain our center of gravity. 
If you actually take a look at the plan form of this thing real fast, uh, you'll notice our center of gravity aircraft has to be basically right here. So we have plenty of room in here to kind of shove tons of fuel in there if we needed it. But the problem is if we shove all the fuel here, then our nose is going to be too heavy. Likewise, there's no room back here to actually shove any fuel because there's these two super duper heavy engines. So how do the engineers actually solve this problem? And it's actually kind of cool how they do it on an F-18. What they actually have is we have wing tip tanks, or wing tanks, which are very, very, very tiny, by the way. I'll show this to you in a second. And we also, of course, have some fuselage tanks, which are going to be doing a lot of the heavy work here. On this particular aircraft, you'll actually notice that there's a tank, this little kind of silver tank here, which feeds one engine, and then we have another tank that feeds the other engine. And then in front of that, we actually have a separate, kind of our big main tank here. And behind that, you even have this little tiny tank that kind of goes around the outside. Keep in mind, this is getting away from in the event, and this is also an F-18 A and C. It's not quite any, a little different. Same concept though. But what you'll actually notice is with all this fuel flow inside of this thing, you need a very sophisticated program to basically keep the center of gravity within its particular limits. Uh, when you get inside the aircraft itself, uh, you'll probably notice that all of these tanks are all represented on here. You can see our two wing tanks. We've got that little tiny butt tank. We have the big tank in the front. And then, of course, we have our two tanks responsible that are actually doing feed. So if you look here, you'll actually see LFD. This is our left feed, and okay, RFD, and this is going to be a right feed. Now we're not carrying any external tanks here. There's a less external, right external, and this will be our center line tank, which again, we're not carrying. So we're actually burning all the fuel off here. Now, the reason this is so fascinating is as the fuel starts to run down, watch what tanks start to get utilized directly. So for example, if I start to pull this down, notice my wing tanks get sucked down first, which seems a little unintuitive given that everything we've seen so far, we're gonna be the ones that go that we normally would see. Now let's all run this down a little more. You'll notice that front tank and the rear tank are running themselves down equally in order to keep the center of gravity somewhat reasonable. Now let's go ahead and pull that all the way down here. You can see we're running all that fuel. And then when we get to the fuselage tanks, you'll notice that these tanks are the only ones really doing any of the heavy lifting here because these are the ones that are closest to our center of gravity. Now the interesting thing is our center of gravity has actually been scooting backwards this entire time as we start to run that fuel down. Now, another thing you'll probably observe on this one is this giant thing. This is the word bingo, which is just reminding us this is how much fuel we have before we need to probably turn the airplane around and start coming down. Now, another thing I appreciate about this aircraft is they have this little diagram down here to make your life a little bit simpler. And of course, you have all the different components we needed for those particular pieces if we needed, which again, you can pop this one on. It's a nice little diagram rather than playing with this. Another fun thing about the F-18, of course, is you have a little page which will kind of make recommendations for your performance. So hopefully this video helps you out when you start looking at fuel systems inside of aircraft. Uh, the general concept is you got to get the fuel out of the tank, you got to get it to the front. Obviously, we skipped really, really complicated aircraft like the DC-6, which has a, whew, that's a unique way of moving fuel around in an aircraft. And of course, we've also missed things like the Antonov 225, which that's its own beast and has a very complicated fuel system. And then, of course, if you really want to cry a little bit, uh, go look at what they used on the Concorde because you'd have to actually change the position of the fuel just keep your center of gravity within a safe range as you're traveling more than the speed of sound. But that could be for another video. Enjoy.